Good afternoon. Thank you folks for joining us. Think Tech Hawaii, time for responsible change. And we're going to talk about guns and hate crimes and the connection between them, and maybe some connections that don't get talked about very often. <clears throat> so we have with us resident expert, Bill Harrison, leading criminal defense attorney and civil rights, Sandra Sims, retired judge, Tina Patterson, urban planner, mediator, arbitrator, jack of many trades, and Louise Zing, leading civil lawyer and women's rights lawyer and women's foundation representative and leader for many years. And then whoever this other guy is, the moderator, who will just try and stay out of the way of the people that we should be listening to. So, Bill, given your background and expertise, the connection between guns and hate crimes, and what do we need to think about that we haven't to help us understand better how to deal with this stuff? Because we're not. Yeah, you know, and, and one of the interesting things that I thought about uh, when, when you hear about these terrible atrocities is um, you, you're going to get people who are gun control proponents and you get the people like the NRA who want the Second Amendment to mean that we all can bear arms. But, you know, the interesting thing about it is the NRA it depends on which way the wind's blowing. The NRA will take a position one way or the other. Back in the, uh, the 60s, uh, the 60s and yes. 68, when Huey Newton um, and Bobby Seale uh, took the California open gun laws and watched around and, and police patrols to make sure that, that black folk weren't being killed by police officers, the NRA jumped to the gun and said, hey, we got to control this. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, when we have uh, black people with guns walking around, we don't want that. So the NRA actually was instrumental in passing the Gun Control Act of 1968. But today, they're basically saying we need to be able to you know, possess and, and, and bear arms. And so they take the position based on what they feel at the time. And, and, and they felt threatened back in the 60s because um, you know, black people were carrying around guns and, and, and um, requiring police officers to, to uh, do the right thing uh, you know, in uh, urban neighborhoods. And uh, that was too much for the NRA. So, you know, it's an interesting issue that we deal with. It's a, it's a love-hate uh, issue with Americans uh, because of the Second Amendment. And so the, going back to the, the original question was, you know, what do we do about this? Um, obviously, we're not going to get rid of guns. Obviously, guns are going to be in bad people's hands. Um, the, the, it, there's no way you're going to get around that, okay? I think as a nation, we have the most, uh, you know, weapons, you uh, in uh, private ownership than any other nation in the world. So um, mm -hmm. it's out there. We're not going to get around it. So I think we have to regulate it if you want to, um, to make sure that people who have bad intentions don't get those firearms in their hands. Um, but to outlaw them totally, um, I think is, is, to me, is a mistake if you think about the, uh, the ramifications of that. So what if we shifted the presumption the other way? Hey, instead of presuming everybody has the right to bear arms as if everybody was part of a well-armed militia, which is what the constitution it says. connects guns with. But hey, what if instead of that, we said, if you wanna have a gun, you have to come in and demonstrate a specific purpose and use for that gun. And if it is limited to a particular area time or activities such as duck hunting or deer hunting season, you get what's appropriate for that, for that purpose during that period in those locations, and that's all. And if you show up with it somewhere else, you are not in compliance. Well, I think our laws are actually that way already. Um, mm -hmm. When you apply for, for firearms, you know, you have to take a test. You have to be able to, um, you know, use that weapon. And that's what the test, uh, you know, the, the, the course exactly. has to approve you to get that weapon. And then, so you do know, you need an AK-47 to bring down a duck or a deer. <laughs> that 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 goes no, back pretty much that. who says that that you have a right to bear i don't think we have i think um in 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 hawaii i don't think we have um the right to carry uh, uh assault weapons there's certainly the right to have you can get the license and take the tests and and you know get the get the get the guns as you may need and 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 that's fine the notion of regulation uh when we start talking about guns i, I it's it's difficult to for me to comprehend why it is 
so incomprehensible to people when there's so many other things that we regulate without, you know, without any dire uh, consequences. We regulate, you know, I mean, seat belts. I mean, a simple thing like seat belts. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when they weren't required and then now they are, and we don't think about that stuff anymore. Um, go back to looking at, um, I mean, even things like, um, like alcohol, okay? Because it came out of the same, I, I'm originally from Chicago, so we have this perspective about <laughs> crime and criminals and stuff that kind of is in our nature. But I mean, not the nature of being a criminal, but you know, it's, it's embedded in our uh, history. But when you go back to the establishment of the Brewer and Alcohol Tobacco and Farms Agency was established following, you know, the, the, the times of Capone and, you know, the mafia and the gangsters and all of that. And much of what they were doing had to do with, uh, aside from the guns, but was the, you know, alcohol, which began regulate, be, began being regulated after that. And so we get, you know, so there is this place now where we understand that that's, that's what takes place and it's, and it's okay. And people can operate and function with that. They don't feel the need to like, I want to go, of course, there's no constitution amendment that says it. And I don't even think the second amendment actually just says you have the right to, you know, complete and total. Um, there's no right, there's no, what I'm saying is that the amendment does not prohibit the regulation of firearms, exactly. which states are permitted to do. And, exactly. and that's exactly it. I, I know in that first, the first big case that kind of came out that talked about handguns, I think it was the McDonald case, was it? And of course, that came from Illinois as well. Um, when Chicago attempted to ban uh, handguns, not the, not the um, um, assault weapons, but handguns because of the, you know, the uh, a gang violence. And it was a city ordinance that banned and that was deemed to be, I think it's one of the first rulings that addressed the Second Amendment in a very long time. Um, that was in, when was that? 2000 something. Anyway, it was the one that actually said that the regulation had gone too far. Uh, it was a city doing it and that the amendment, as the as Supreme Court saw the amendment, um, the Second Amendment did not permit them to single out and certainly the city to single out and ban, you know, handguns in that way. So that kind of spurred a lot more discussions and arguments about the ability of, of municipalities and in states as well to regulate and how far they could go. So that was part of that discussion as well. Um, so, I mean, yeah. Yeah. That, is, that is a timely discussion because the Ninth Circuit just issued an opinion. Yes. Specifically that in Hawaii, um, the county can regulate both open carry and concealed weapons. And so there are a number of states who, um, and other um, uh, areas in which uh, there's a different opinion and different uh, appellate opinions. So the Supreme Court's going to have to actually yeah. decide as to what, is, what does the Second Amendment really say? Um, and uh, it's going to be interesting what they, they determine since that court is a fairly conservative court now. William, I want to pull the thread on what you started talking about earlier, and that is the, the, when we talk about guns and you indicate it, and it's true, I, I reside in, on the East Coast in Maryland, and the use of firearms is regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. I am in an area where I'm bordered by Virginia and the District of Columbia we are required to take training, as you um, mentioned earlier, if mm -hmm. you want to be a firearm owner, and I'm specifically talking about handgun, you have to undergo training. You, if you do want to possess a firearm, you have to be fingerprinted, your records are sent to the state police, they conduct an investigation, which takes approximately 30 days. Um, so you actually acquiring that firearm is going to take at a minimum 30 days. But it's also important as a firearm owner to know what are the regulations. So I'm a firearm owner and I, I, we can talk about the journey. It was not an easy one and I can explain why I did it. Mm -hmm. um, no, but, but knowing what I had to understand was I cannot have my firearm in my vehicle with the bullets 
in the firearm. They need to be, the firearm is can be in one place and the bullets separate, meaning that the firearm can be in the car, the bullets better be in the trunk. If I'm pulled over for any reason, I'm, I'm basically in violation of the law. The District of Columbia, however, has a different law mm -hmm. and I can cross over into the district and it's very different, same for Virginia. The, what I, wh where I see, and I'm a proponent of the regulation, I'm a proponent of saying, if you have a, a firearm, why do you need an assault rifle? As you said earlier, if you're going duck hunting, do you need an AK-47 or could your shotgun do what it needs to do? You also talked about concealed carry and open. Maryland, as an individual, you're 99% of the time, you're not going to get um, a license with concealed carry unless right. you know that you are in imminent danger or that there's some other extreme circumstance. The general public is often not granted concealed. The District of Columbia has concealed. So, I, I, you know, pulling that apart is, is, is important because when what we normally hear is, oh, the person got the firearm overnight. Well, what's the rule in that state? What what's the, the regulation? What is the state when we really look further? Is there a, a, a period of, of waiting? Do they do an investigation or did the person cross the border? And when I say cross the border, they cross to another state where the regulations are a little bit easier, a little more flexible. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 really talking about that. And again, the open carry. I, I know I have a friend who lives in Texas. Texas is open carry. I can tell you again as a firearm owner. Open carry frightens me. There's no reason you need to be in the supermarket with your shotgun, assault rifle, or your, you know, your um, Glock 46 on you. I, but I think part of it is the glamorization of firearms. We see it in the movies. We see it in, in certain ads that, you know, it's sexy to have a firearm. And the truth of the matter is it's a huge responsibility. When I took my training, the one thing that I walked away with was when the instructor said, you now have an instrument that can kill someone. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to, to possess that responsibility? How are you going to manage that responsibility? So I'm all for doing the, the diagnostics to make sure that someone is mentally stable and spending the time to find out how many firearms. Maryland, you can't buy more than one firearm. If, if you want to get a second firearm, you have to wait another 30 days. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know I said a lot, but I just no, I wanted to pull that thread because I, yeah. I, I think it's important for people to know it just doesn't happen random, you know, randomly. And it's in many states, it's a very um, lengthy process, or it can be a lengthy process. The, you know, the idea of going in, oh, I like that CZ9. I'll take it today. A responsible gun owner or gun, gun, um, gun shop is going to say, nope, I don't want to lose my license. I don't want to be fined or shut down. It's going to take 30 days. We will put the gun aside for you, but we have to go through the proper steps. Exactly. But there's a, lot of states, there's a lot of states in which you, you know, I've been to states and I looked in like pawn shops and stuff and walked in and said, can I buy that gun? He goes, yeah, just give me an idea. I take the idea and you can have this gun. So there's a lot of states you just walk in and you, you can buy it. There's no, there's no waiting period for that. Um, and those people who argue, they, they argue the same thing. They, they argue, look, you give someone a license to drive a car and they're, and they're driving a weapon and, and they kill people every day uh, driving cars, okay, running red lights drinking alcohol and getting in the cars. So yeah, everything is not aiming at them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, no, no. So yeah, so, so the, the, that's a real legitimate question is, um, you know, do we regulate, do we properly regulate dangerous instruments? And some people say we don't. So some people get licenses to drive cars that shouldn't be driving cars. <laughs> Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, um, exactly. I, I think that's why the, the, the 1968 Gun Control Act was put into existence because there was a myriad of um, regulations across the country, and the Gun Control Act tried to uh, put into place a um, uh, an umbrella coverage to to say that number one, if you're a felon, you can't possess a, a firearm under federal law. So no matter what the state law says, if you're a felon, you're in federal you're in violation of federal law if you possess a firearm. Okay. Yeah. And they had other regulations that, that went into place to, to try to patch the holes between the various states. But still, yeah, you know, it's, it's amazing you can walk into some states and just buy a firearm. 
<laughs> when the other point that Tina brought up that's very directly related is besides regulation, education. Absolutely. What proportion of gun owners would you guess actually have had significant hey, firearm education, gun use education? Are you asking me? I think that the, the vast minority of them do. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think so. Might be single digits. Exactly. Well, uh, I, you know, I've known, I, I, I have some friends, you know, that have uh, firearms and not necessarily living here in, in Hawaii, but, you know, live in kind of rural areas and they actually have that. They're, they're teaching their kids how to use, you know, to use those kinds of weapons and to do it safely and how you store it and where you keep it and all those kinds of things. I think people who are, I'm, I do believe that those that are responsible gun owners, and I think quite honestly, probably the majority are responsible. I mean, just like what Tina is talking about with, you know, with her own, you know, with her own possession, you're understanding the significance of, of, of what you're doing and what you're holding. And I think most people do realize that. Unfortunately, what ends up happening is that while we have these discussions is that there is these ones that pop up like these shootings of people who, don't have that sense, who don't have that training, who don't, and, and, and they're already having to deal with other kinds of issues. And so we end up, you know, with situations where, you know, there's a school shooting, there's a, you know, there's a church, there's a people in the church, there's the, 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 the ladies in their, you know, in their spas, there's a, the, there's the people in grocery stores, there's the people, I mean, those, I mean, I don't want to minimize them, but No, I'm not I think what you're pointing that. out is that, you know, besides the regulation issue, which is a huge one, because we can't even get a consensus on that, but the waiting period you know, sounds like a good move. But there's the whole mental health issue too. And then what is the responsibility of people? Do they know enough to point out? Because just in these two last two incidents, it seemed like yeah. there were red flags along the way. Here, you know, in the first the Tuesday hate murder, um, he, was, he was having psychological problems. And then his parents, apparently shut him out of the house and then he was left on his own to go buy a gun and then take it out on innocent people. Um, and then with this recent one too, there were talks about how he had anger management issues. His family saw him playing with a rifle. Um, you, you know, there must have been signs along the way and yet there just seems to be this whole level of lack of family and personal responsibility going on to uh -huh. monitor uh -huh. these people. Mm -hmm. Well, Lisa, I'm curious um, be because you mentioned something and I've been noticing this and I've been hearing this, especially in the midst of the pandemic, there's been an increase in the number of domestic violence reports oh, yes. and firearm usage is usually part of that. Um, mm -hmm. In addition to beating, sometimes the, um, the victim is, is shot yeah. or um, fatally wounded with a firearm. And oftentimes you mentioned a pawn shop, William, that that's generally um, the way that you could easily possess a firearm versus going through a proper channel. But I was wondering, Louise, if you would share a perspective regarding this correlation between firearms being used in a, um, as a, a weapon of power. Um, oh, yeah. Especially when we're talking about domestic or oppressing a group that you believe is either um, inferior or needs to be tamped down? Yeah, well, we certainly have seen, you know, I think there's, there's data that shows that there's been an uptake in domestic violence because of our shutdown. Um, and more, more often than not, it seems like it's gun violence that causes the murder or the serious injury. Um, so I mean that's a whole other level. I'm not sure how you you spot it. How do you prevent those situations? Regulation is one thing, but again, I think it goes back to just needing to have resources and community resources to attend to people's mm -hmm. health and give give them safe places to go or safe outlets or you know ways to get anger management. Yeah, yeah that's a really important point, Louise, because. Hey, 
the minute that somebody mm -hmm. brings a domestic violence or mm -hmm. temporary restraining order complaint, first thing that goes, all the guns. Right? All the guns. You can have all the knives yeah. you want, all the poison you want, all the dynamite you want, but no guns. Right? But guns got to go. Yeah. So the presumption yeah. shifts. So it keeps bringing me back, and everything I'm hearing keeps bringing me back to why shouldn't there be a presumption that the gun use ownership need to a be established with conditions and one of those conditions be education and responsible use mm -hmm. well it, there should be absolutely but then if you think about it the, the very fabric of our country and those who who are um second amendment proponents mm -hmm. is the we have liberty and freedom in, in, in the United States. And we, and you gotta understand how we became a country, right? We ran away from Britain. We ran away from the king going into your house, the troops coming in and, and doing what they wanted to do. And the whole idea was if we have guns, no one's gonna do that. The government's not gonna walk into your house and do what they did in, yeah. in, in you know Britain. So that's part of our fabric of our country. So how do you disabuse people of that belief that they have the liberty to possess weapons. Um, and then when you start, when, when you basically put regulations in place to provide buffers so they can't get weapons, they're basically saying, look, the timelines are not um, there to protect people. The timelines are there to keep guns out of my hand. And I don't want those timelines there. I don't want those regulations there because I have that Second Amendment right. That's it's part of our mm -hmm. Constitution. So, you know, it's that's a difficult issue to deal no, with. But if we go if we go back, Bill, to the Second Amendment, if the only people that could have guns or did have guns were a well-regulated militia, we would not be talking about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, but the problem is, is that the other side says, you know what a well-regulated militia was back in, in, in you know, the, the time in the formation of the country? Those are folks who got together in a town and <laughs> said, guys are not coming into my house. So exactly. let's go. Okay, that's what they consider a militia. They didn't consider it, you know, our our state, um, you know, armed forces that we have in each individual state and et cetera. It was folks who basically said, you're not coming into our houses. And exactly. so we're going to once a week and be a citizen patrol. That That's the militia that the other side argues that, that we yeah, talk. But about. we also know that if we went back to that point in time and determined the intent according to that, oh, only one of the five of us would be able to vote. <laughs> Well, that or own property <laughs> that too <laughs> that too yeah but i i think it was mentioned on um uh vice president harris had mentioned this whole discussion about you know taking away guns and doing regulations is sort of like this false equivalency this is this one has nothing to do with the other and and what you're you're talking about but i think it's it's still part of that i mean i, I it, it's difficult for me to conceptualize that responsible people are adamantly against having some reasonable regulations on the, perhaps the type of weapons you can possess and who can who can obtain them as opposed to someone saying the purpose of any sort of regulation is to literally take away my right to have guns that's not even the discussion that's not even what we're talking about but it keeps getting bounced back to being we're talking about take, you're going to take away the guns. And that's not the discussion. That's not what we're talking about. Um, I mean, the, it's not what we're talking about. It's just finding some way to, to do a reasonable regulation. And I think in Hawaii, we do have some fairly reasonable you know, regulations on who can possess and, and how you can obtain. Because I think our concealed... Um, um, our weapons laws are similar to what you're talking about, Tina, about where, where you can have the gun. The gun has to be in a container. It has to be in your trunk. Uh, it has to be, you know, on your way to, you know, the, the, the range or someplace that you can carry. It's not, yeah, I can just walk around and hitch it to my um, jeans belt. Uh, that's not quite how it's done here either. So we have those kind of really strict regulations about that. And, and, and people comply with that. Yes. Yeah. I, Actually, I, we, have the, we have the strictest gun laws in the nation, Hawaii has. Yeah. In the nation. Okay. So um, 
I think, sorry, we're running out of time. I, I, I wanted to say this because following up on what Sandra said, um, the, so the conflated argument, what that results in is, and we've seen this in the past two years, a run on firearms. So whether it's assault weapons or um, handguns, suddenly they're not available or the price has increased 25, 30%. Um, at one point in 2020, ammunition was not available in, in many gun shops and it was because people were stockpiling. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's where the conflated argument goes. Uh, Chuck, I, I also wanted to touch quickly upon the, the correlation with hate crimes and, and the use of firearms. And it's because of the easy access and because of the, the, the regulations varying, if there are any, and open carry versus concealed. And I think about Dylan Roof and the fact that he literally sat in a church, waited until people had closed their eyes for prayer, and then didn't shoot off one or two bullets. He had the equivalent of 70 bullets. He had rounds, a magazine. He had several magazines. So he literally had to discharge that magazine, load it back in the gun and continue with what he was doing. Um, for those who don't know what I'm talking about, think about the matrix. Um, when Neo was in one of those scenes, he literally is dropping and inserting magazines. It's intentional. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the, the, the correlation between the anger and using this, this weapon as a means to destroy really um, for many of us who consider ourselves rational, prudent people, we can't make the connection. But yeah. my personal opinion is that's where it's coming from. It, it's, it's instantaneous. You, you know, you, whoever your enemy is or whatever you believe is, is your enemy, you're taking them down and you're taking them down quickly. It gives oh, these people, great. these weak people, a sense of power. It, yeah, yes. you're right. It's a power tool. Yes. It is. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It is. Well, here's the question then. Yes. Is. is it really the underlying attitudes and behaviors, including the discrimination, the race, the ethnic, the LGBTQ, all of it, that generate the abuses for which gun access is a means, it's an avenue, and others who don't want their so called Second Amendment rights, rights intruded upon? wind up protecting the abusers mm -hmm. because of their own, exactly what Sandra said, the polarized attitudes, behaviors, and communications that we've degenerated into. And that's the tide that needs to be reversed. So well, I guess you're, you put out the deeper problem, Chuck, which is, okay, gun regulation is one thing, but we have a whole problem here with hate and division. Yes. And, you know, the failure to, to um, tolerate each other and recognize differences. And, yes. and then that gives people the feeling that they need some little, you know, this tool to act out their insecurities. Exactly. exactly. Yep. Well, someone, okay, so uh, last words, everybody, Bill? I was just gonna say that, that someone once said that the, the gun is a tool of a cowardice because if you really wanna kill someone, try to kill them with a knife. Okay, you have to be visceral. You have to go and you have to struggle with someone. Pulling a trigger is easy. And so it is, it is a cowardice weapon um, and put in the wrong hands, um, it does what, what we see happen uh, in, in, in our day-to-day -day existence nowadays. And there, and I, I agree, and then as, as Louise pointed, there are some things that we need to be paying more attention to when it comes to these issues of who, goes and has the bills that they need to do that kind of power trip over people. And that's, a lot of it is still mental health and we still need to address those issues. There's still the stigma, you know, attached to that. There's still, you know, family members who are, you know, maybe looking at a situation and afraid to act, not knowing how to act, not knowing what they can or cannot do. Um, and then the person acts out, there's a gun and they act out. I mean, that's what we had in this situation last weekend was again, family that kind of knew something was amiss, that something was wrong. And then, you know, he takes it out on, on these women in various locations. So again, very intentional, very intentional, driving from one place to the next, to the next, to the next. And, you know, I, um, I'm, 
I, these things have shaken me. I'll just be real honest. I'm just shaken by all of this. And I don't well, then, really know how to respond. I'm trying to, like everybody else, trying to figure out how, why, where do we get, how do we get to this, to this place? How do we, how do we wind back so we can talk to each other without it being, I got to pull out my gun and blow you away because I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We got to pull it back. We got to pull and it while back. It's, while it's exactly. all the time that we have today, let's give that some thought because a lot of underlying issues, people issues, attitude issues, behavior issues, behavioral abuse issues, societal and connections issues. of mental mm -hmm. health, of regulation and many other things, and education. Thank you all. Come back and see us in two more weeks. We will be back hey, April 8th. And April, wow. Thank you for joining us. Think Tech Hawaii, time for a responsible change. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.